Welcome to the inner world of filmmaking. I'm your host, Tammy McGarrow. I'm an editor, podcaster, and still photographer. In this show, I will interview filmmakers in all facets of production and distribution. I'm excited to have director and cinematographer Matt Millen on today to discuss his latest two projects, Arrowhead and Stronger Than Bullets. Welcome, Matt. So happy to have you on the show today. So happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So i first like to start off with what was your road into filmmaking? And what I've seen from some of your projects is there's a lot of adventure style travel in the documentaries you do all over the world. So how did you decide that's what you wanted to do? It wasn't a direct road at all. I mean, I started in physics. I, that's what my degree is in. And I did the engineering stint for a couple of years, but I just was not into it. I mean, <laughs> I was probably a pretty poor engineer, mediocre at best. And uh, I, my friend was working on a, he was an engineer as well, but he had a film idea that he wanted to shoot. And this was, I think, 2002. And then since then, he, he asked me to help and I haven't looked back. I got into adventure a lot because my mom is an adventurer. She, you know, she's been mountain climbing for, I guess she started a little late, but since the early 90s, she's been just, you know, going on adventures, mainly Ladakh, India. She's probably been there more than anybody else outside somebody from there. And wow. just, yeah, so she, she gave me the bug. It was just something that, she was always looming over us, and she was always obsessed with going to these um, off-the-beaten-track type places. And so that really instilled that into me. Well, and I guess, you know, with a lot of uh, documentaries that especially take place in different countries, um, and you have to, you're sometimes even just a one-man band or a couple of people, very small crews, um, you really... Do you, I guess the question to you is, do you really have to be in shape for some of the things that you have to do, like climbing up probably mountains and... You're going to get in shape. <laughs> it's, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, on the job training. Yeah. Yeah. And then what, what made you want to go into uh, being a cinematographer in particular and editing? Uh, really? Because I'm mainly a director, but... I do cinematography because, you know, it was just me and another guy. So, so, we, so we both, we both do cinematography and, uh, it was just, uh, needs must really. Um, do you have your own gear? Yeah, I do. Okay. And then what, what gear do you have? I have, uh, God, what is it? Uh, a Panasonic S1H. I have a Panasonic GH5. I've got it. DJI Mavic 2, I've got countless lavalier mics, mainly Sennheiser. Um, what else do I have? A couple GoPros. I, I've really expanded over the last year because of the project I'm working on. So, but I, I have a lot of gear. So. Yeah, and I was just kind of curious, do you, um, is it just typically your gear or do you sometimes rent gear based on the project? It's almost always our gear. I mean, okay. we have rented gear in the past, but particularly when we were transitioning from HD to 4K, we rented gear. And what made you decide on the Panasonic? Because I had a GH5, uh, which I still have, and that's been an absolute workhorse. You know, I took that with me on Arrowhead. Uh, I took that, let's see, we went to Niger, for another film we've been working on, on a Nigerian general who's fighting the jihadists with peace. Uh, I took wow. it to Togo, which was, it was a project on Bodun. And so Panasonics, they're very sturdy and very durable. And I, I just developed an attachment to it. And when the S1H came out, you know, for this new project, I needed a bit better Panasonic or a bit better camera. So I opted for that because, you know, I know the menus so well anyway, so. Right. Um, do you typically only take one or do you take more than one camera on a shoot? I now take everything. <laughs> I take the, the GH5. I thought it was, I wasn't going to be using it very much, but since I have all the telephoto lens lenses for it, for this last project, I needed it quite a bit. And I also take the drone 
I use the drone quite a bit and I do take GoPros because we did a lot of filming in the car in this last project, so. Yeah, GoPros are the best. They're small and you can just put them anywhere, so. Yeah. They're pretty cool to have um, and pretty inexpensive, so you can get a, several of them. Uh, so you also edit. What editing system do you work on? I mainly use Premiere, but this last project, they've been having me use Avid. So I've been using okay. Media Pro a lot, or Media yeah. Composer. I'm getting Pro <laughs> Tools, Media Composer, getting them mixed up, yeah. So right. I've been using that a lot lately too, but mainly Premiere. But also I've gotten started to use DaVinci because it's a, nut, a lovely all-in-one. Yes, it is. Yeah. And amazing color grading. I guess that's what they're oh, pretty it's much for. industry standard now, so yeah. Yeah. Your most recent project, uh, Arrowhead, uh, you worked with uh, Janie McGill, and I talked to her on a previous podcast about her journey through the Empty Quarters, and I and she had mentioned that um, you kind of came on at the last minute to film this 28-day <laughs> uh, expedition, um, grueling expedition, I would think. So um, what... Like, what were your thoughts coming onto the project? And then once you got to the project, I'd love to know your experience. Well, it actually took some convincing of me. My fiance at the time had to convince me to do it because I remember, so I met Janie a month before. I interviewed her about the project uh, because we had a mutual friend and I was absolutely fascinated with what she was doing. I was just amazed and uh, I, rem I recall I was at a Nine Inch Nails concert. I remember being pretty sick t as well. And I just got a call from Janie saying, you know, basically the, I was her last chance saloon to to have a filmmaker come along with her. And at first I, I you know, it was just too short time, too, too little notice. I mean, she was basically saying I had to leave in three days. Wow. And, you know, at first I was... Uh, I, I just don't think I can do it. But then my fiance at the time convinced me. I, I got to give her a lot of props for that, saying, well, this is what you do. This is You kind of have to take this opportunity. So then three days later, I was flying out to Salala in Oman. Wow. So, I mean, how did you approach the project in filming? Oh, that was interesting because I, I went with probably not enough gear. You know, there's ND filters I'd want, I'd want to use, things like that. And I had to go without all of that because I just didn't have any at the time. And it was just very, very bare minimum. So it was, that was a little bit stressful. But, it, it, you know, it, I always am pretty confident that I'll figure something out. So, and thankfully we did, so... Well, so how did you approach every day? I mean, I heard that you walked almost half the mileage with them. Like, what, 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 I'm just curious because I know that you had a car there too. So what was your approach? Did the, did you get up, they start walking and then you get up later, the car drops you off and then does it pick you back up or are you walking with them until the next point? I switched off. I would walk with them in the morning some days and walk with them in the afternoon every other day yeah but okay. it was mainly walking backwards too so yeah. yeah yeah um and then you know i would think with the desert um what was the most challenging thing especially with your equipment i would think keeping it clean um My God, it was like, awful so like what were some of the challenges on the project for you that was the and main challenge was trying to keep the uh, equipment clean, which was just a fool's errand. You know, it was definitely a Sisyphus uh, pushing the rock up the mountain type of scenario because no matter what you do, your camera's going to get dirty. So, right. but and I, I spent two or three hours a day cleaning gear, probably at least. And it was the worst conditions I have ever filmed in. So. <laughs> Well, right, and also I know that they were doing um, journal vi video journals of the day, which means at night, here you are having to spend, well, she was telling me like an hour, hour and a half just cleaning your equipment, but then also having to set up to do these um, 
you know, video journals of their experiences. So how did you work that? Well, for one, thank goodness I had them do that because we, we may have struggled putting a story together without them because that really crystallized my thoughts on how to construct the film. So uh, that was the easiest part, though, honestly, because uh, we usually found a place where there was no wind and I would just set it up and then like an assembly line, each woman would go for and talk for five, ten minutes. I'd press record disappear for them for 10 minutes and then come back. Well, some of them longer than others. Like for instance, <laughs> Janie's were about 20 minutes, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, she probably had a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, what was the most rewarding thing of this project? Oh, it, it, you know, it's one of those things that hits you afterwards. I mean, even for a couple of years when the, the, you know, we had to do other projects and this project kind of had to be on hold, it didn't really occur to me that I witnessed them do this and this extraordinary thing that these three women did. And it was just a, a real spiritual type of coming of age journey. And it just didn't occur to me at the time. And it just, it, it shows, it really made me lament the Sometimes the role of the filmmaker is, you don't, I'll give an example. Uh, in 2004, we captured snow leopards on camera in, in Ladakh, India. And it was the first time a uh, snow leopard had been hunting that was caught on camera. But wow, you know what? It, I felt distant from it because I was looking through the lens the whole time. And I think for a couple of years, I just forgot that we were there and I forgot the smells. I forgot, you know, everything extraordinary about that place, which is just otherworldly. And the process of editing this film has really rekindled that and kind of gave me that sense of wonder and awe again that, and that I was just lucky enough to be a fly on the wall witnessing these three women do an extraordinary thing. You know, something that not following the footsteps of other explorers, but following in the footsteps of Bedouin women who had been doing that for a thousand years. Right. So. And how was the, um, did you have any physical uh, issues like um, like spraining an ankle or anything that happened to you on the trip that was then challenging to complete? Uh, fortunately, no. It was pretty straightforward for me. Yeah, I think if I did it now, I'd have all sorts of issues. But back yeah. back then, it was actually very straightforward. Right. Just maybe, I mean, surprisingly few aches and pains. But once again, I didn't walk the whole distance that they did. So. Right. Yeah. And did you get the um, the drivers as well? Did you interview them? Yeah, because the I thought they were going to play a more major role in the film, so I. Like the second half or the first half, it depended on the day, I would just be with them, uh, filming them. You've also directed and edited Stronger Than Bullets. Do you mind telling us about that film and how you got on board with it? Oh, that one will always be my favorite film, I think. And as much as I love I think Arrowhead is a phenomenal film, but the, the emotional connection, because... I had, uh, when the Libyan revolution kicked off on February 17th, 2011, one of my best friends in LA is Libyan. And I was over at his house with his wife every day, just watching in amazement as, you know, the people rose up against this, you know, this dime store tyrant that was Gaddafi. And we were having coffee one day and he asked me if I wanted to go. He's like, well, you're a filmmaker or you at least want to be a filmmaker, this is your chance. And my first reaction, of course, once again was, eh, I don't really want to, I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I don't want to be a part of a war. I'm, so I, I I basically respectfully declined, and he went off. But then I, I went to my brother's bachelor party in Las Vegas, and this was just about the time Gaddafi's forces were pushing in on Benghazi, and we were wondering if there was going to be you know, if NATO was going to get involved. And I just looked around in Vegas, you know, and said, there's, there's got to be something more to this. Right. And then I, I made the decision right there. And what, three weeks later, I was, you know, crossing the border 
in uh, from Egypt to Libya. So, how long were you shooting there for? I don't know. Maybe it ended up being fifteen months. Wow. Yeah, I was actually I mean, going to move there. I, I was, I became a part of the music community. You know, they became my best friends, and I just felt like it was Benghazi was home. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the film is about? It's about a rock and roll revolution in Libya during the the actual revolution when, you know, that was the the thing is everybody was rushing to the front line, but a, a really beautiful story was burgeoning right in the center of Benghazi with this, you know, heavy metal, uh, rap, uh, outlaw country music. All these people came out, hundreds of musicians just out of the woodwork, really for the first time able to express themselves like this in public. You know, in the past, especially the last 10 years or so, they could do it in private, and, you know, Gaddafi probably wouldn't bother with that, but there was a time where they were burning in music, uh, Western music instruments in the streets. Now, is... Is that footage, um, is that archive footage, or was that the footage you shot? Because I did see the trailer. I mean, beautiful music. It's a, a, a both. The film is made up of both because, you know, I, I probably captured three or 400 hours of footage at least in my time there. Probably even more, actually, because I was, you know, living there. So Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of the film is from my camera, but there were certain things you know, that you just have to get archive footage for. And the lovely thing was that, you know, pretty much everybody in Benghazi was excited to give me footage, so. Yeah, oh, that's that's really great. Um, and also in the, in the trailer, I did notice that you, uh, or <laughs> that somebody was filming, I'm not sure if it was you or not, but there were shots being fired. So was, were you shot at while you were filming? It, we were stupid. I, because you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, like where you live anywhere, there you there's there's a lot of boredom after a while, and this was after the revolution, and things started going a little sour. You know, it took a while, it took many months for things to start going sour, but there was a a group that tried to to uh, steal a bunch of Toyota Hiluxes. And the local, one of the militias decided to stop them. And, you know, it really nobody knew what they were doing. And I remember my my buddy and I who I was with, uh, another American guy, we were just, we were hanging out with our Libyan buddy, Hamuda, and we just heard all this gunfire. And so, stupidly, we went to go check it out. And, of course, we get there, and all our friends in the whole neighborhood are there watching. So... <laughs> I and mean, I I remember it was like it was like a street party or something, and then but then you know these things turn so unpredictable and suddenly we got caught in the middle of it. I mean, you must have been like really scared. Or I don't were know if, you? I think it was a case of that you don't get scared until after the fact. Okay. Because it happens so quickly, and then you know, you know, just run, and that's yeah, and then it probably. Probably a week later is when it probably it hit me. So, but then there were there were moments like that. But you know, I don't think I would have. I think the biggest danger was dying from stupidity, uh, or d dying. And I mean, I was much more scared driving in Libya. That was absolutely petrifying. Sometimes. You and know, what that, made it petrifying? Uh, it's got one of the highest death rates in the world for. Uh, car accidents, and especially when uh, I would go to Egypt, they had these vans that they called flying coffins that you'd go in. Oh wow! Yeah, it, it was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> Every time I I was in a car and we saw some horrendous car accidents, right? But at the same time, what we saw, especially then, was because they were so used to ha not having services help them the people would just naturally organize into groups to help the other people. Some guy would just go direct traffic right away while the other guys tried to get the people out of the car. And then probably within, you know, and very efficiently, within five, ten minutes, they'd have everybody at the hospital. Wow, uh, that's yeah, great. It, 
it was i mean car accidents are not beautiful but it was beautiful especially in the the early days of the revolution to really see people working together and wanting to like out competing with each other to be better citizens and that gave me quite a bit of hope so so when you came on to this project i mean did you have an outline did you know the story or did the story kind of evolve once you got there and started shooting i didn't know what i was going to film when i got there and it took a while to figure it out and then uh we went down to the media center and it was just this beehive of activity you know some floors people were doing art others they were making i think there was it went from one new or two newspapers in january of 2011 to about 600 newspapers in February of 2011. Just to, I mean, everybody had something to say, but it was just this, this beehive of expression. And then you know you had the, you had a hip hop floor, you had the heavy metal floor, and it was just so exciting. I mean, so exciting. And, but even then, uh, I t- kind of took a different route because I became really close to these guys, and. Uh, I decided I was going to try to have a music festival in Libya. And at the same time, there's these Libyan artists that had decided that too. So we naturally just came together and went on that ride together. And I kind of forgot about the film for almost a year. Because oh, wow. we were just constantly planning on the new, the music festival, you know, to really bring everybody together to... Um, celebrate this explosion of music it was like woodstock i mean sadly the music festival didn't happen though because it became uh first off that you know an idea is going to be stolen pretty much anywhere so then there were a, a number of groups trying to do music festivals but the one of the big uh news shows or i think it was al arabia they tried to have one and they'd made it a couple days before ours on purpose, but uh, they got bomb threats. And because of that, the at the time, the Muslim Brotherhood was running the courthouse area where we were going to um, have the music festival, and they just pulled out. And rightly so. And I yeah. mean, no, I, they made the right decision, actually, at that time, because they thought it was just going to be too dangerous. And we all agreed at, at that point. It just wasn't worth the risk, so. Yeah. So how long did it end up taking you to edit the film? That's a good question, because I, I kind of lost sight of what the film was about for about a year. So I finished editing, and it, it's 2016. However, uh, the story was ongoing, though, because... Much of the story is about the aftermath of the revolution and the, and its descent into uh, a you know low grade civil war, and but also examining the whys of it because you know a lot of people it's very easy to say well it was better under Gaddafi, but Gaddafi and his mafia regime laid out the whole conditions for this to happen. So I mean it, it's like a what I. What I've thought about Tito and Yugoslavia, the, the greatest crime he committed was not leaving a system that could survive him. And and Tito was a much better leader than Gaddafi, don't get me wrong, but then the same thing with Gaddafi. All the the atrocities committed, that may have been the greatest one, that they ran it right. like a mafia state. So. so where is the film now? Uh, it's on Amazon. It's on, I know it's on Now TV in, you know, Sky. Uh, it's uh, um, Al Jazeera. I think they still can play. It, it played on Al Jazeera several times, and I think they still can play it a couple more times. Oh, and, and uh, just a number of other sites. Roku. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, with the funding of the film... I mean, how did you pay for it, or how did your friend pay for it? Uh, it was largely paid. Uh, I think we did a couple Kickstarters. We didn't make that much, but that paid a bit for us. So friends helped out a bit. Uh, I I put a lot of money into it, 
But then my, my dad came in as a producer of Last Resort and pretty much saved the film. And then also this guy I met in Libya, this um, he was there at the time trying to get, he was representing Muse. And he was trying to get them to play in a festival, but then he saw what we were doing and he thought that was way cooler to have it as Libyan artists. So, but he became producer of the film because of this whole thing. And then we've been collaborating and we've been close friends ever since, but he put money into it. So it is, you know, friends and family, basically. I think my brother put a lot of money into it. Yeah. Yeah. My so, sister. <laughs> so. Well, that's great. Yeah. That's, I guess, what another addition to having family is yeah they, they support you family and friends so um i'm curious how does one live there for over a year is that just the financial support of everybody supporting the film that allowed you to live there too or did you get other gigs there to live i got lucky because uh my living buddy they own an apartment complex and so he just basically gave uh, us a room and so it was rent free so then I was just paying for food here and there but then also you're living in one of the most generous cities in the world and everybody wants to feed you and everybody wants to <laughs> yeah so there was there was a lot of that so we ended up not having to spend that much money I, that's kind of like the big the Benghazi character though too is to so in a lot of ways like one big family so yeah. How are you able to live there um, without a visa or something? Like, how does that work to live in another country? At first, you didn't need one. You know, okay. when I first went there, I had a reporter's badge that I made. <laughs> that was enough to get in. But uh -huh. then by by about February of 2012, they were you had to go into the office and get a visa. And it was very easy, though. So... At the so, time, it was extremely easy. It was harder when I went back again in 2013 because then I had to go to the Libyan embassy in the UK and then apply early. And then, so it was a little bit more difficult then. God, to simpler times, you know, yeah. where you could just travel and stay. Uh, so d what projects are you working on now? Uh, there's one that we're searching for a, a stolen item that... Uh, is a mo iconic movie from an iconic film. I can't really say much more about it yet, but okay, it'll be coming out hopefully later this year. And that one, I am, um, I'm just, uh, I'm helping out the investigator. I'm basically the cinematographer there for the investigator. So we've been going mainly on the East Coast, uh, in the deep mafia territory, <laughs> and it's been How an exciting. absolutely, yeah, it's been an absolutely fascinating. A uh, very comical thing as well. Yeah. So, but I'm not the director in that one, though. So. Well, that's exciting. Yeah that that this one is that was the, all of last all of 2022 was almost I, almost all of it. I was just traveling and just doing that project. So. So you keep pretty busy. I mean, you're going from like one project to the next. Yeah, because. Uh, now I've, because uh, I do color correction as well and uh, sound design. So I decide, you know, because we, we spend a lot of money on Stronger the Bullets on that. But this one, I, you know, I just decided I'm going to do as much as I can myself. So we'll, and we'll see. Then, then we'll go if we need somebody. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess it's always great to have a bunch of different talents because then you can do a lot of stuff on the project instead of having to hire out and spend more and more money. Exactly. And yeah. uh, that's come in handy, uh, you know, quite a bit in this 20 year ride. So, yeah. yeah, it almost feels like that's kind of what you have to do is you really have to be a jack of all trades, you know, um, because people are expecting you to, to do, a, to wear many hats on projects. Yeah. It feels like. And also that, you know, especially after you've shot a film and after you have it together, it becomes tricky to get post-production funding. It right. It really does. Because they're, well, you already have a product. So no, yeah. it needs, you don't quite understand the process. Yeah. Yeah, it always seems like they put more money into the production of it and maybe 
uh, pre-production, post-production than they do the, I mean, pre-production, production versus post-production. It seems like that's where a lot of these projects kind of still live for a while because there's no funding to complete it. Well, and my biggest critique of many documentary films is related to that because usually music is the last thought. And for me, how I think music should be the very first thing. So I'm really excited. We created a whole new genre of music for this film, which yeah. uh, I call the falafel Western. But my, <laughs> but my buddy Angelo, because we, we both have the same type of music taste, and he's an unbelievable, just an incredible guitarist and, and composer. And so we've, we've, we wanted a music that had a real attitude, but would also confound you instead of doing, you know, getting Lawrence of Arabia type music that you can find, you know, um, on uh, freesound.org or whatever. It was more of... We wanted, you know, we wanted to, I always want to confound people with the music a little bit. And that has a lot to do with Stronger Than Bullets because it, it's very confounding. It's, it's, right. unexpe it's, it's unexpected. So, and, but I, I think that, yeah, a lot of that too is that, you know, that and the, you know, sound design and color correction, they can make or break a film. Yes, they, are they can. so important. And the sound designers and color correctors are, very much saviors of films and oftentimes so now um with sound design you know i was just curious with a documentary uh are you adding in nuances to that as well like you know f fully type uh yeah things because the the gin kind of are a motif in the background through the whole film and so it, it's a matter of uh constructing the sound design even through the working with uh, Angelo, the composer, on kind of getting that vibe. Because, you know, the, the whole theme of Arrowhead is, you know, basically confronting the ghost of your past. And so that's where the djinn play a very interesting motif in it. So we want to at least have people, they may not understand what you're doing, but they'll feel it. Right. That sense of mystery, and which is... I mean, visually, it's so easy to do, but you can just add uh, just such a deeper layer with, you know, certain sounds, so. And I got to say, there is a certain um, knack to do that. It's very detailed Deep. and yeah. very nuanced. Uh, I, I wonder if people really have an idea of what goes into sound design. I've se I oh, have a friend that does that, and it's like layers upon layers upon layers and that just make the film pop in a way. And and like you said, uh, you know, get you to feel emotions in certain parts that you didn't realize, you know, like that's when a good music and sound design, it's just like it really pulls you into the film. One of my best friends, uh, Jeremy Grody, is a sound designer and the, the by far the best one I know and just going to his house and seeing Pro Tools open with the 6,000 tracks and how he he uh he pushes through them it's because it, 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 but also that his sense of timing is just I mean he's a musician but and he's a very good musician but his sense of timing is extraordinary and you know that's you have to treat the film like a song and yeah. it was great with Strong and the Bullets because it was basically a punk rock song. So it had a punk rock, rock vibe through the whole thing. And that's the kind of the motif I went for the whole time, especially the frenetic, fast paced editing. That it just feel the idea was to make it a freight train. And Jeremy actually, the sound design he did on it to add just the little bits that I didn't have, it just absolutely made the film. Now, did you learn from him? Yeah, I, thankfully I learned from him because it's it's very, ex, you know, to get a good sound designer is very expensive. So right. So I'm not nearly at his level. But I, I figure, you know, if I just take a, a few months rather than five, six days to do it, that, you know, and then also consulting with him and other people that I'll be able to at least get something that's... um good enough. Yeah, it's always great to have um 
experts in your back pocket that you can always ask to and also learn from. Yeah. You know, that's what's really great about the film community or building your own film community. Um, then you at least have people that you can ask questions to and and also to help you on those projects and get them worked. I think we have the best mentors surrounding this for for Arrowhead in particular. And we did for Strong in the Bullets as well, but for Arrowhead, it's just a the the amount of wisdom and knowledge that um, I've acquired through other people, and they're all helping out on the film right now. So it's a, not an easy story to tell, you know, because you could easily make it an expedition film, but then you have the problem is, well, what if nothing happened on the expedition, like? What I mean, nothing happened, you know, that nobody got stung by a scorpion or bitten by a cobra. There was not the... So the stakes weren't that. The stakes weren't the physical, even though it was extremely difficult. And, and you know, it's not easy to walk for 30 days straight and through these this horrible terrain. But to put that in the film, you need to take a different tack. And something more like the film Wild, where nothing really happens to her. I think she loses a shoe on the, you know, but it's her, her story, her relationship with her mom that makes it such a beautiful film. And with, with that, because we did a version last year and it was just basically a travel log or two years ago. It just didn't have that. We needed something that, you know, their relationship with each other, their relationship with their past, that's what needed to tell the story. And then it clicked. It just clicked like that when we were able to do that. So, Well, and you went back and shot them later, didn't you, to get the reflection back to the project? Were you yeah. on board with that too? Yeah, except that I hired somebody in Oman um, this last year because I couldn't go out. So I hired her to to um, get the last interviews. And I'm glad I did. She was absolutely brilliant. And she she brought stuff out that I don't know if I could have. So I've interviewed Janie since I, I go to the UK a lot. So every time I've been there, we've tried something. <laughs> you know, you know, it doesn't always work. There's been a lot of uh, uh, things that didn't make it through, you know, that that didn't make it past the cutting floor. But, uh, yeah, th it's been an ongoing process. But I think finally we have a uh, picture lock, so. Now, were you helping edit this film, or? Yeah, my my uh, business partner, my buddy and I, we edited it together. Oh, okay. So Great. It's just, yeah, me and him mainly. So, and, but, you know, it, it's a number of other people having to sit through every iteration of the film that which i feel so bad for i really do because there were there were some poor iterations of the film you know it's one right. of those things that the film's terrible until it's not the editing was a very collaborative process because so, we we got you know reams and reams of notes from people that really shaped the film well and you know, as we all know with documentary, I mean, you're really putting together the film in the edit, I think more so than shooting for the film. So there's no like um, bullet points or no script that you can go, OK, this is where it goes and all that stuff. It's I think that uh, documentary style editing is a lot tougher editing because that's where you're going to, like you said, make or break the film. I mean, it's either going to be something or it's not, but you really have to figure out what the story is and is it an interesting story to tell after. The first uh, the first couple times trying to, you know, for any documentary film, just going, well, what do I do with all this? Is awful. <laughs> it, But, you know, that. but what you look forward to is the last times. Yeah. <laughs> when when things start clicking. I right. remember with Stronger Than Bullets, it just was a case of uh, switching a scene around that it was just something was not working and I was just banging my head over and over. And then I just thought to switch the scene around. One like this, and then suddenly everything, it felt like a narrative film. It just clicked. And yeah. we had the same thing with Arrowhead where switching a few scenes around 
and uh, not worrying so much about what happens as much as what they're going through. That's why you can call it a document, or that's why, unless you're watching something on like History Channel, which the themes are usually different. This this theme is very they're personal themes. So and when you remember when you, you just have to keep on remembering that that these are theme driven and that's what separates them from say uh, a true crime series on Netflix or at least the ones you see lately that, right. that they're not necessarily theme driven uh yeah it it must be challenging or or when do you know the film is done you know cuz it's, it's never just done. when you I know. Yeah. I think that would be the challenge is like, you know, you're editing this film and then at some point you have to say, okay, this is a story and we're going to lock it now. And I I would think that editing and shooting for that matter could take years unless you have a timeline like we have to get this done by this date because of this. Then it really forces you to just say, okay, this yeah. is it, I guess. With Stronger Than Bullets, it was... That was interesting because I usually hate my stuff. I hate the stuff we work on. And that was really the first time I I watched something and went, wow, that we did this. I can't believe we did this. And actually, Arrowhead feels that way now, too. Just that suddenly it feels like uh, you immerse people in the desert, for instance. Whereas before, just there's something that was just holding it back, you know, keeping it distant. But now it, and it's just that feeling when when you watch it, it just where you actually almost, if you can watch it as an audience, I think that is that is when you have a film. I think when you kind of yeah. distance yourself from the whole process of you being the chef putting all these ingredients together with you know all the people around you that helped you and it, it's a matter of watching it for that at the audience and getting that feeling like this was the first time this uh the the cut before this one where i said wow i witnessed them do this that was the first time it occurred to me after you know we did this in 2019 2018 2019 yeah and it took that long for me to realize that I witness what these women did. I think it would be, it's an interesting process, I'm sure, to be filming it. And then you're bringing you into the filming, right? Because you're there. And I think you can only see so much when you're doing it. And then after time, and now you're editing it, you're also looking at it in different ends, lenses with a, a more rested mind and body. Uh, to get into the edit, but is it challenging when you are shooting and editing it that there's kind of no separation, like you were in it from the beginning to the end? That's why uh, having my business partner, uh, Eric Amin, who's also very ruthless when it comes to throwing some things out, which is <laughs> exactly what you need, because he wasn't there, and that's exactly yeah. what I need. I needed his bird's eye view on it. Or Alistair, the uh, the producer I'm working with on this uh, other project, having him or Michael or David and Lynn, the producers, or Adam and Janie. You know, Janie, because Janie, this is her first uh, film, but she's a natural, she, she naturally understands story and she particularly naturally understands uh, how to frame, uh, how to frame images. I mean, she's got a, an amazing eye for the, I mean, I, I basically an eye I wish I had when it comes to camera work. And if you see her camera work, you'll understand. She thinks laterally. I mean, she's a true artist in that. And to have her also with her feedback. And this is, she was a novice filmmaker. This is really her first film. And it's kind of humbling to think that you're, wow, somebody with that natural talent and I've been doing this for 20 years. But I've been more than excited to to have that feedback because, I mean, the, the purpose is to make a good film. Right. So 
uh, yeah. ego, yeah, it doesn't help at all. So, well, and I also think that every project you're learning something from it from everybody. And I know that Janie's a photographer, so I mean, I'm sure that that helps with the composition, <laughs> especially when you're shooting photos and stuff. That um, I just think that's what the wonderful experience that you get with people is you get a different uh, perspective. Yeah. But keep in mind, you know, just when we were doing this, I don't think she was a photographer. Oh, she wasn't. We I thought. She, oh, <laughs> I mean, she she'd done. I mean, she she loved photography, but but now, yeah. I mean, just to, she had all this natural talent that was just kind of waiting to be unleashed on the world. Right. And now, if you look at her stuff, you'd be think she's been doing it for thir for thirty years. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any last thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Uh, you know, one thing this, this industry is, it takes a lot of luck, but it's, a, it's a, the odds. It's probability. The longer you do it, the more likely you're going to get lucky. It's, you know, and even, even that, it, it's, it's always an evolving process, too. You could get lucky on one thing, but you're, you know... It's a gig life. Yeah. So you could have a great year and then a, a lean year. And it's it's not an it's it's a very challenge it's very challenging in that way, but at the same time it beats real work. So Right. So it, it's well worth the price of admission. I love it. Well thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh well thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to get out there and make a film. Reach out to your local filmmakers group to get involved and connect. Please subscribe to the show if you like it. And follow me on Instagram at Tammy Maguero. Until we meet again, what's your story? <laughs>